Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome to the 2023 Telehealth Summit brought to you by the California Telehealth Resource Center. I'm so glad you could join us for this uh, session on the future of prescribing medications in telemedicine. I'm Dave Boston. I'm a medical informaticist and director of virtual care for OCHIN, and I'll be your moderator for this session. Let's start with some housekeeping. Uh, today's session is purely for informational purposes. CTRC has no relevant financial interest, arrangement, or affiliation with any organizations related to commercial products or services discussed during the telehealth summit. Closed caption is enabled. If you would like to view subtitles or a running transcript in a separate window, you can access them via the live transport icon on your Zoom control board. Uh, bar, excuse me, and uh, this uh, uh, is being recorded and will be available at, on the uh, CTRC uh, uh, YouTube uh, in by the end of the month. And finally, please make liberal use of the Whova chat window. Um, we will be answering your questions that you post throughout the session uh, at the end of, uh, at the end of this session. And with that, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Beiju Cha, a senior telemedicine success manager for Doxy.me and a clinical pharmacist. Beiju Cha is an accomplished pharmacy automation expert and thought leader with over 12 years of experience in the healthcare industry. As the senior telemedicine success manager at Doxy.me, Beiju plays a, an, an integral role in improving patient safety and operational efficiency by leveraging cutting edge technology. Beiju's journey began with a PharmD from Medical University of South Carolina, followed by completing an MBA at the Citadel. His passion for healthcare innovation led him to specialize in medication safety and pharmacy automation acquiring extensive expertise in various pharmacy information systems and EHRs. Beju, the floor is yours. Well, thanks, Dave. And, you know, that's a that's a really kind uh, introduction. It's a lot of words for just, I'm very curious and I love to do stuff in healthcare. So, um, you know, let's kind of share my screen here and let's go through this presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Again, my name is Beju Shah, and today I'll be speaking on, about the future of prescribing medications in telemedicine. I will say here that this is a little bit of a wordplay um, to be completely transparent. Uh, since the conference that we're attending today also implies the future is now, I decided to leave my magic crystal ball behind and instead share where we are in terms of this topic, and then maybe give you some future indicators of where we're headed. So again, some disclosures, uh, you know, any of the information here uh, that's provided in this presentation is not to be regarded as legal advice, and it's purely for informational purposes. Um, so always make sure you consult with a legal counsel uh, if, it's, that's, if, it's, if you need one for your organization or your practice. I do have a financial interest, as Dave mentioned, I, I am employed by a telehealth company. However, today my intent is really to share knowledge as a healthcare professional. So a little bit of background, uh, you know, Dave, you, you, you're really kind of to mention, you know, some of my background already. I just wanted to cover the high points. I am based in Charleston, South Carolina, and I spent over a decade working at academic medical centers here, uh, primarily in the pharmacy informatics role. And as part, part of that role, it, you know, I have been an educator as well. So, you know, I just wanted to give upfront, give credit to Aislinn and some of the organizing team here today. Uh, for the gracious invitation. They've, you know, they've really put a great deal of effort into this summit, and it really shows. I met and learned from some of the amazing community here today um, and this week. And you know, just just uh, you know, that alone has been uh, worthwhile. So I'm really glad to have everyone here join, and I'd love to kind of connect with you at some point. So while I am based in South Carolina on the East Coast. Uh, you know, California is, is one of the most progressive states um, to spotlight in terms of telemedicine and especially, particularly in terms of prescribing. So uh, it is truly a pleasure to be here today and to talk about it. 
So just a bit of housekeeping as well. If you do have any questions, we can answer them in at the end of the session, or uh, I'll make sure to post the, them into the community forum afterwards. Um, and also, if you'd like to just be more present during the session, feel free to switch off your phone notifications or close any windows that you might have open on your desktop. Um, and you know, maybe answer some of the polling questions that we will have in the session. I've already added them to Hoover, so you'll kind of be able to find that pretty easily. Okay, so by attending the session, my hope is you will gain a better understanding of the current landscape of prescribing in telemedicine, as well as the emerging trends and technologies that are shaping this field. You should also be able to identify any potential opportunities uh, that then you can apply for safe and effective virtual care. So let me start by asking all of you here today, uh, what, do you, what do you first think about when you hear the term house call? What does that phrase conjure in your mind? And I'll give you a few moments to kind of think about this. And if you want to enter some, some comments in the chat, feel free to do so. Um, but yeah, I just want to get your imagination going here. Hey, if you got some time to think about it, I, you know, uh, I, I just want to share maybe a personal story at, at this point as well. Um, to me, it's pretty powerful. It's a powerful phrase because, you know, I recently just had an eye-opening experience um, and I actually witnessed house calls firsthand. So um, I actually had a sick 80-year-old father-in-law um, in overseas uh, that needed some care uh, for his chronic care disease. And, you know, I took an emergency trip uh, from the US to the city of Mumbai, India. Uh, and this was just a few months ago. Um, and I was able to see, you know, a house call take, take shape. So he had multiple physicians arrive at his house um, over a two week period of time. And, you know, sometimes these physicians were, were you know, called or they were booked on the same day. And so it was really a bit of a game changer in how they were able to treat him at home uh, without having us admitting him to the hospital. You know, they were able to see things like, you know, his complete medication history, um, what over-the-counter drugs he was on, what herbals. Uh, they were able to see what, you know, diet he may be on as well in the house. And then, you know, since he lived in a high-story apartment, they were able to see maybe, you know, other issues uh, at play, you know, mobility, how, how does... How does he interact with his environment at home? So these are pretty important factors that are often missed when you have a patient coming into the clinic. So telemedicine medicine can be seen as sort of this modern day house call. Rather than ringing your doorbell, clinicians now have this ability to ping your smartphone and to remotely diagnose and treat different disease states. So with telemedicine, we can bridge some of the gaps between clinician and patient, regardless of location. Also, this digital house call could be conducted in a variety of modalities, as we know. Uh, synchronous consultations, where patients and providers interact in a real-time uh, you know, video conference call. It could be asynchronous messaging, perhaps where patients can send messages or images even to their providers and receive responses at a later time. And then there's other ways as well, of course. Um, you know, as, as remote patient monitoring technology continues to mature, I'm sure we'll see more continuous monitoring services built into this paradigm. I think we heard a little bit about that uh, with 19 labs uh, presenting early on today. So it's no surprise to us that, you know, COVID-19 has really had a significant impact on telemedicine ad adoption you know, social distancing requirements and the need for, to minimize in-person contact really propelled the technology. And, you know, what was once niche practice became mainstream. So this really has led us to rethink our healthcare delivery system as a whole. So just to reflect on where we are today, let's review where we were prior to the pandemic. So the adoption of telemedicine in the US was relatively slow. There were several factors contributing to this sluggish uptake. One was limited integration of technology within healthcare systems. So many healthcare providers 
struggled to incorporate telemedicine into their existing workflows as they really had to contend with these often rigid EHR systems that weren't designed, you know, initially designed for the service. Another challenge was reimbursement policies that played a huge role in slow adoption. You know, they lacked, there was, there was a lack of consistent and comprehensive reimbursement policies for telemedicine at the time. And this made it financially challenging for healthcare to basically buy in and invest into the service. Another barrier was resistance for, for patients and for providers. From the patient perspective, you know, they were skeptical, skeptical about receiving virtual care. A lot of them preferred face-to-face -face interactions. And then from the provider's perspective, uh, they were mainly concerned with potential liability and quality of care issues by providing these remote services. So it's important here to recognize how crucial it was for hospitals largely academic medical centers, but many hospitals that were early on in this stage and were really the early adopters of telemedicine. Uh, telemedicine was used in really specialized areas at the time, uh, such as radiology and telestroke services. And these programs really recognized the benefits of telemedicine in improving outcomes for patients. So in the next slide, this slide here, I will focus on prescribing medications within the framework of telemedicine. So when it comes to prescribing medications, healthcare providers must navigate this complex web of government regulations. These regulations aim to ensure patient safety, prevent abuse, and the diversion of medicine. And so this kind of maintains the integrity of the overall healthcare system. So looking at the slide, if you look at the slide on, uh, you know, the section on your left, you know, federal regulations govern the majority of prescriptions when it comes to controlled substances. On the right, however, of this balance, you know, individual states have their own rules uh, that encompass all other rules around prescription drugs. So everything else, basically. And so it's crucial for healthcare providers to be familiar with and adhere to these federal and state regulations to ensure compliance in their practice. So now let's focus specifically on controlled substances and their regulation that govern prescribing. So the law places these substances into five schedules based on their medical use, abuse potential, and safety. The Controlled Substance Act of 1970 is a federal law that regulates the manufacture, importation, and use of these substances. Interestingly enough, this law is actually part of an international treaty to control drug trafficking and abuse. So this, this act provides a mechanism for drugs to be added to these schedules, removed, or transferred between schedules. And this is done by the DEA and FDA. And these decisions have, are all based on different factors that the agency reviews. They review the scientific evidence, they review public health risk, and you know, what kind of history and patterns of abuse are seen in the market. So I'll give you an example. So buprenorphine is a Schedule Three drug today. But when it was first introduced in 1985, it was actually classified as a Schedule Five drug, which is lower on the table here. And the reason why it was actually introduced as a low dose formulation at the time. So it was seen as a relatively low, low, lower risk to the public. So when prescribing controlled substances, it's important to know that schedule one to five, uh, all these schedules and how they're classified under. So let's take a deeper dive into the summary and this chart here. So schedule one drugs have the highest potential for abuse and possess no acceptable medical use. So some of the examples that you've probably heard of are heroin, or LSD, or ecstasy. And so due to this sort of severe abuse potential and really no use of these drugs, uh, for the purposes of prescribing, we're only concerned with schedule two to five. Schedule two drugs, however, have a high abuse potential, but they also have, you know, they're recognized to be accepted for specific medical uses under certain conditions. So you know, these are your opioids, largely, uh, you know, treating moderate and severe pain, like oxycodone or fentanyl, 
or even cocaine, they all fall into this category. However, when we move down the list here uh, from schedule three to five drugs, the abuse potential decreases while their accepted medical use becomes more prominent. So here you see things, you know, drugs like ketamine or Xanax um, or, you know, buprenorphine, as you mentioned. Um, and these are just some examples of, of these, um, these category drugs. So also, it's important to know that only certain providers can have authority to prescribe controlled substances. So some of the providers are physicians, dentists, uh, and, and some other mid-level providers within their scope of practice. Uh, the key point here, though, is every provider that can prescribe a controlled substance must have a DEA registration. So putting on my pharmacist hat for a second, not only are there restrictions on what can be prescribed and who is authorized to prescribe, but also we have this other condition here, which is how much can be dispensed. So for instance, if you look at the Schedule II drugs, uh, there are no refills allowed with this category. So every time a patient needs another um, round, if you will, of, of this drug, a new prescription must be written every single time. My colleagues in pharmacy call this the one script, one fill rule. Schedule three to, to four drugs have a limit also on their refills. Uh, they're only allowed five refills or 120 days supply, whichever comes first. Um, and in schedule five, there is no re refill limit, but it does expire, the prescription does expire in six months. So to summarize, it's crucial for healthcare providers to have a comprehensive understanding of these schedule classifications, not only just to be compliant with the law, but also to understand how it affects patient access to actual medication that they need for treatment. So while the Controlled Substance Act provided enough protection for two patients, it wasn't until the internet came along that changed this dynamic. So before 20, 2008, uh, online prescribing of controlled substances was fairly unregulated, sort of like the Wild West. Um, it, it really led to illegal distribution and you know, there's really a lot of fraud going on with online pharmacies and gray markets. So this unregulated environment posed significant risk to patient safety and public health. One notable case highlights some of the challenges of this era. So in 2001, an 18 year old honor student from La Mesa, California was found lying unconscious in his bedroom from an accidental drug overdose. His death was a result of a combination of narcotics that had been legally prescribed, purchased and dispensed from an out-of-state out -state prescriber and an online pharmacy. So you can see this individual here in, in the slide. His name was Ryan Height. Many of you have probably heard of this name before. So Ryan was an isolated case, but in the early 2000s, there was a proliferation of rogue online pharmacies selling controlled substances directly to patients. Um, and this was done with probably little or no oversight at all. So in 2008, with the hopes of preventing similar calamities, Congress passed the Ryan Height Act, which is it requires clinicians to conduct at least one in-person examination before prescribing a controlled substance. Now, this prevented clinicians from signing prescriptions en masse without an established patient-provider relationship, which was good. Um, they also, the act also shut down the entire cottage in industry of what is known as pill mills. And so this law really continues to ensure that we have these protections in place to this day. Now, the one caveat here is that it also made it more challenging for ethical clinicians to legitimately prescribe and dispense controlled substances via telemedicine. So this in-person requirement has really become this proxy measure for the patient provider relationship. Now, there are uh, some exceptions to the rule uh, as, as, as always. Um, so for this in-person requirement, 
Uh, I've listed a few exceptions here on the slide. Note the public health emergency is also included in this list. Um, you know, there's also been actual mention of a special DEA registry for providers uh, that could be excluded from this in-person requirement. But as of this presentation, which is on June the 2023, this registry has not been created as yet. But it could indeed be a future opportunity for telemedicine. We just don't know what that would look like yet. Okay, uh, so while the federal government sets the baseline foundation for prescribing regulations at the national level, it's important to also keep in mind that each state, each state's medical board govern and enforce federal laws, as well as they can also extend these laws so I've listed a few ways here that you know, the states really can do this. The first is the state regulations that govern the way the patient pa provider patient relationships are established. And this is in the context of telemedicine. These regulations define specific requirements that may include procedures on how to handle consent, uh, documentation, or even standards of care. Now, the states also may impose additional limitations on prescribing beyond what the federal requirements are. These limitations can include dosage restrictions, quantity limits, or even duration of prescriptions. We kind of mentioned refill quantity limits as well, and that's, that's part of what the state uh, medical boards can, can impact as well. And some states also may require healthcare providers to complete additional registrations specific to prescribing. So these registrations may include obtaining a state-specific controlled substance license, uh, or perhaps even completing specialized training programs and certifications uh, just to sort of enhance provider knowledge and competency for safe prescribing. Also, states have implemented the, these prescription drug monitoring programs, PDMPs as we call them, uh, to track prescribing and dispensing of controlled substances. State regulations may mandate that clinicians actually use these programs to access patient prescription histories and identify potential misuse or diversion. So as a reminder, these are all based on how individual states develop their own regulations. And so this sort of results in this lack of consistent regulation by each state. And really, it, you know, to be honest, it kind of impedes the ability for us to stay up to date with all these regulations because each state is very different from each other. Now, I will say at this point, you know, um, I always like to refer or use the ref resource the Center of Connected Health Policy provides uh, as a way to map some of these, uh, you know, regulations by the state level. So. That, that's a great resource if you if you do get a chance to check it out. Um, I highly recommend it. So the practice of telemedicine often involves providing care to patients and within the state as well as across state lines. Now, when it's the latter, that's when we run across problems. So the, you know, I really want to kind of highlight this point here, which is in order to prescribe, the traditional licensure model mandates providers be licensed in the very same state that the patient is located. So as you can imagine, this creates an additional level of complexity if you're prescribing across state lines. So navigating the intricacies of multiple state licensure uh, processes can be very time consuming and very costly to healthcare professionals. Now efforts are underway to address this challenge. However, you know, there's still some work to be done, but you know this development uh, around interstate licensure compacts and agreements that are ongoing. Now these initiatives aim to streamline the process and facilitate reciprocity of prescribing between states, um, and so that's a good thing. Uh, but really, just remembering from this slide, if you, one takeaway you know to have from it is, with every telemedicine visit, it's really important to know where your patient is located while providing care. Okay. 
So shifting, shifting to shifting a little bit in the presentation from where we are today, um, why is this all relevant? Well, as we know, in 2020, the world changed for us. We're in the midst of this unprecedented pandemic, and this resulted in our healthcare system needing to rapidly adapt to these different challenges. Ultimately, the pandemic was a catalyst that introduced temporary flexibilities, and these changes were necessary to maintain social distancing requirements at a time when the healthcare resources were strapped. One of the significant flexibilities was this waiving of in-person requirements that we talked about to control substances, um, and, and specifically from the Ryan High Act. So as a consequence of these flexibilities, the increased demand for remote care uh, really surged. We witnessed this rise of these telehealth startups. Uh, all of these telehealth services became more mainstream, and they really became the primary method of healthcare delivery for non-urgent issues. And this created a significant opportunity for innovative startups to, to really thrive in this sort of environment. So I want to tell you a few kind of case 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 stories here. Um, let's talk about a few of these startups that kind of ar arose from the sort of pandemic. Cerebral is one of these many telehealth startups that, you know, they actually launched a month prior to the pandemic, and they saw this sort of, sort of exponential increase in, in their services. You know, COVID allowed that sort of rapid expansion to occur. And, you know, Cerebral is really known for offering therapy and medication for mental health uh, patients at the time. After a short while, you know, you know, they were kind of, um, they were doing very, they were very successful in, in what they were doing. After a short while though, uh, some employees actually came out, uh, a few whistleblowers actually came out and claimed that the company wasn't conducting appropriate visits. They also reported fake accounts that may be taking advantage um, of getting prescriptions for, uh, to sell in the black market. And then also, uh, there are some allegations that came about where the company was prioritizing their profits by pumping out more prescription orders uh, for control substances like Adderall, Xanax, simply so they could ensure a better bottom line. Even cerebral patients themselves raised concerns uh, as they had received prescription, these prescriptions uh, after very brief initial assessments and very brief follow-ups. So I will say that Carly Cerebral is under investigation by the US Department of Justice and the DA over its prescribing of controlled substances. And this is, this is kind of interesting because as government continues to sort of recognize the extent of where patients have relied on telemedicine to improve their access of care throughout the pandemic, Cerebral story has actually made it a little bit wary about the pitfalls when, when you, they do relax some of these rules. Now, of course, they're not really uh, considered a pill mill, uh, you know, the pill mills that we saw in the early 2000s, nothing like that. Um, but it's important to recognize here that there is some need to have the right level of checks and balances uh, using our technology today. So here's another kind of case report uh, or case study. Um, and this is a this is a case of a well-meaning law that caused more harm than good. So Alabama passed a law preventing controlled substances from being prescribed via telemedicine without an in-person visit. As a result of this law, Bicycle Health, which is actually a California-based telemedicine startup, uh, they've been initially treating patients nationwide for opioid use disorder. Uh, Bicycle Health had to inform its Alabama patients that they needed to transition to local providers because of this new mandate. Then, less than a month before the deadline, when about a fifth of their patients were able to find help, uh, rather than sort of have this mass discontinuation of care for these very vulnerable patients, Bicycle Health orchestrated what would be known as the Alabama airdrop. So in July of 2022, the company flew two Alabama licensed physicians to Birmingham, Alabama, where they met with 300 patients in a hotel conference room for over three days. This allowed the patients 
to continue receiving their medications from Bicycle Health for up to 12 more months, which actually is kind of ending fairly soon. Uh, so in the meanwhile, Bicycle Health is actually partnering up with some nonprofit organizations to create a more long-term sustainable plan. But this is an interesting case because this sort of showed us that state law that's intended to protect patients effectively created this artificial shortage uh, of you know, healthcare provision and really did more harm than good. So again, we have to have the right checks and balances with both technology and regulation. So when the public health emergency for COVID in the US officially ended uh, this year, May the 11th, the fear, of course, was that some of these temporary flexibilities that we've seen uh, and were granted would expire. However, the DEA and the Department of Health and Human Services published two notices for proposed rulemaking. Um, and this was done on March the 1st of this year. So we'll kind of cover those in the next slide. But you know, just to make sure you, you, you're, you understand, the proposal proposed rules uh, would allow for prescribing of controlled substances via telemedicine without an in-person requirement in certain scenarios. So the outcome of the proposed rules isn't final yet, but there, you know, there was like an avalanche of uh, public comments uh, during that proposal. Uh, I think we had like 38,000 public comments um, and, you know, they're all being reviewed by these agencies, but uh, because of that, and part of partly because of that, you know, in the meantime, they, the agencies have issued a temporary rule to extend some of these flexibilities that were granted during the pandemic. So effectively, our healthcare community has been given sort of this like one year of grace period um, for, for basically prescribing controlled substances using telemedicine. So the Temporary rule really aimed, you know, the goal for this temporary rule was just to avoid any lapses in care. Uh, there, there was a worry that, you know, patients, vulnerable patients would, would not get the care they would, they would not have, you know, would normally have during telemedicine visits. And then also, uh, secondly, it was to avoid overwhelming the traditional healthcare system even more by shifting patients from virtual care to in-person visits. And so here, here are some of the key components of the proposed rule that we mentioned in the last slide. Uh, and this relates largely to prescribing without any in-person requirement. So essentially what this says is, um, you know, any non-controlled medications are permitted without an in-person requirement using telemedicine. Um, and in all controlled substance schedule two drugs are not permitted uh, and this basically is the same as what we had prior to COVID. However, the changes that, you know, the new updates that they are, you know, reviewing are schedule three drugs and schedule four drugs specifically, as well as buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, they would be eligible to have that waiver of not having that in-person requirement uh, for the initial 30 days uh, where that patient will get initial 30 day dispense. Now for subsequent refills, you know, they would require an in-person visit. But this is sort of, again, this is sort of under review. No final decision has been made, but it's a kind of a promising signal that, you know, the government and these agencies are looking at increasing flexibilities in certain use cases um, to really help benefit patient access to care. So we're sort of past midway and maybe closer to the prep end of the presentation here, but just to assess how much you've been following along and retaining the knowledge, uh, I do have a question, a poll for you. So, you know, you might already have seen this in the in the Hoover platform. Uh, and if you have you responded, thank you. Um, but, you know, the question I have for you today is, can providers authorized to prescribe oxycodone write a script or a prescription six months post public health emergency without an in-person visit requirement. So if you remember, I'm gonna give you a little bit of time to um, think about this, but feel free to answer your, you know, put your response into the poll 
um, in the platform if you haven't already. And then we can kind of um, answer this in, the, in a few minutes or, or, or in just a, just a minute. Hey, um, looks like we have a, on the poll, we actually have a mix of uh, yes, no, and uncertain. So that's, that's quite interesting. So um, I'm going to go ahead and answer the question here. So so the answer is actually indeed yes. Um, and yes, because as long as the patient provi uh, provider patient relationship has been established before or on November 11th, 2023, uh, then yes, the the oxycodone prescription can be written. It's a bit of a tricky question because you have to first of all you have to remember uh, the uh, the schedule for the drug. So for oxycodone, it's a Schedule II drug, and then secondly, you have to know when public health emergency ended, which was May 11th, and then sort of back calculate six months from there. So that that would fall on November 11th, 2023. And uh, you know that that's sort of where these temporary flexibilities come into place. Um, and so you know again, we have a one year grace period, um, but there's certain conditions that need to be uh, answered for that grace period to take effect. So so this is a question that's probably going to come up, you know this entire year. Uh, it's actually a pretty relevant question that providers will have as well as some of some folks in your organization organizations. So um, you know, if if this is something that has been discussed or will is being discussed at your organizations, um, great. If not, feel free to kind of share this with your colleagues as well or have that discussion. Um, because I think it's pretty it's gonna be a pretty significant one uh for this year. Hey, uh changing gears a little bit here, let's briefly talk about some of the recent issues that might provide some future insights for us. So during the pandemic, the healthcare community had an opportunity to not only prescribe and treat outside the traditional rules, outside the box, so to speak, but we also had this opportunity to measure and evaluate the impact of that. So we generally refer to this as sort of evidence-based research or evidence-based medicine, right? Uh, now, buprenorphine is a great example of this. So as I mentioned, buprenorphine is classified as a Schedule three drug, and it's typically used to treat patients with opioid use disorder um, and also pain as well. Now, the pharmacology of this drug is actually pretty interesting, so I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of it, but just give you a high level understanding of it. Um, it actually works uh, similar to opioids in in the fact that it has uh, it attaches to the same parts of the brain receptor as opioids uh, as well, but in a little bit of a different way. It has a really high affinity, but it's less potent or powerful for the lack of better words. So buprenorphine can reduce the cravings and withdrawal symptoms uh, that patients experience when they stop using opioids. They can also, it can also prevent uh, patients from getting high if they keep, you know, use them again. So that's great. And then also it doesn't have the same risk profile uh, for overdose, let's say. Uh, because it has a sort of ceiling effect at high doses. So meaning patients aren't able to develop any addiction to it as well. So, you know, in all uh, intents and purposes, it's a fairly safe drug, um, as long as, you know, it's not combined with any other uh, drug out there. Like, um, so, so, so I think it's, you know, fairly safe from the risk profile. Um, in 2000, yeah, in the year 2000, the Drug Addiction Treatment Act authorized outpatient use of buprenorphine for the treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, and so this was where patients in the past had to go to very specific treatment centers to get this treatment. Um, and then this, this act really kind of opened it up because it said now you can go to an outpatient clinic um, where there's availability of this treatment. And so it kind of expanded access in that sense. However, it also the, the drug still required 
clinicians to, you know, the government still required clinicians to go through many hoops or jump through many hoops to still get training and be registered to give this drug. Um, and that was called the X waiver. So essentially, you know, what they would do is they would attend an eight hour course uh, for physicians. And then I think it's 24 hours for APPs. And, um, you know, they would essentially complete that course and they would get an X added to their DEA registration. So, um, you know, it was a bit of a hurdle. Also, another barrier was that in the first year, these providers could only see up to 30 patients at a time. The second year, probably be about 100 patients per provider. And then I think ultimately 275 patients per provider if you have additional board certifications. So, you know, there's a lot of barriers there. Uh, now, interestingly enough, expanding access to the X waiver uh, has been a focus to address this opioid crisis. And it's a very good one. Ironically, with all of these limitations I mentioned, there have been very few providers actually opted to get this type of authorization to prescribe the drug. So after years of advocacy uh, by certain groups, and then uh, also recent studies being released, showing the benefits outweigh the risk of this medication, uh, in, at the very beginning of this year, in fact, in January 12th of, of 2023, federal agencies issued guidance on removing the X waiver completely. So as stated in the guidance, an X waiver is no longer required to treat patients with buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. So going forward, all prescriptions for buprenorphine will only require a standard DEA registration, and there will no longer be sort of limits on how many patients a provider may see. Uh, of course, now existing laws for on the state level uh, still apply, but you know I think this is a very important concept overall. Essentially, this, this is just a great example of how advocacy and evidence-based research can dismantle archaic laws that we have in place, and therefore really improving access and care to our healthcare system. So during the presentation, I briefly spoke about how individual states can implement regulations that extend beyond the federal regulation. Uh, so making them more restrictive in a sense. I've listed a few examples here. So for instance, the FDA loosened related, you know, loosened these rules related to home use of abortion medications. And they sort of removed this requirement for in-person dispensing. Um, so at that time, you know, several abortion clinics began to really ramp up their telehealth services. In response to uh, several several states actually proposed bills that would then reinstate this old FDA rule. So as of 2023, you know, as of this year, basically, more than half of the states in the US have passed laws requiring at least one in-person visit before receiving a medication for abortion. Uh, and then there's actually some states explicitly banning the use of telemedicine to uh, receive abortive drugs. Uh, now, access in, has been preserved in California, but, you know, really, regardless of what side of the fence you're on this topic, these state-by-state -state patchwork of rules that are fairly inconsistent with each other, um, and also regard, you know, they, they sort of like kind of go into, or they affect prescribing using telemedicine, really pose this liability and risk for clinicians. Because for clinicians, it's really a burden to stay up to date. Um, and be compliant, uh, you know, they, they can, you know, if they're, especially if they're practicing in multiple states, uh, you know, they can inadvertently risk uh, breaking the law. And so for them, for clinicians, really it means either losing your license, it, it could mean incurring hefty fines, and, you know, it could go all the way up to serving jail time. So, you know, I think uh, in, in some of the sessions early on this morning, you know, I heard discussions around provider shortages, and so, you know, this is a this is really a public health issue. You know, if 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 we are losing providers uh, because of these sort of um, not being compliant on all of these different patchwork rules and laws, then you know that's something to be wary about. Okay, so we're almost at the end of the last part of the session here, and I just want to briefly touch upon some of the technology drivers. 
uh, of prescribing uh, or that affect prescribing and how you know that makes an impact to our healthcare delivery system. So the High Tech Act of 2009, which I'm sure everyone in this room knows about, uh, was a particularly important milestone. It incentivized adoption of EHRs and it led to integration of telemedicine technologies within these systems. Personally, this is where I started my career at the very beginning as a new practitioner. Um, in fact, it was, it was around 2013 and onwards that I was became more responsible for migrating our legacy system to another integrated EHR solution at the time um, at MUSC. It was, I think, it was a pretty exciting uh, time. I mean, it was very challenging, of course. Uh, you know, you have to introduce new processes and and uh, you know change many clinical workflows. Um, but you know, the integration, you know, after a while, you know, looking on on the high side, the integration was key because um, it really affects some of the strategies for the health system. Uh, one of which was actually to, you know, they wanted to build a robust telemedicine center at the organization. And this integrated EHR uh, gave them that sort of ability to create this really robust um, system out of it. So uh, so that that's, I think that was a great mile marker. Um, now also looking at California, the legislation um, assembly bill 2789 in California that was signed in actually in 2018, but it took about three years to operationalize. Um, this actually made it mandatory for e-prescribing to be integrated into these systems. So, so now today, you know, it's it's a requirement that every every prescription drug, controlled or non-controlled, is required to be electronically sent to the pharmacy. Now, there are some exceptions, you know, if you're prescribing for terminally ill patients or if you're uh, prescribing for patients who are going to on taking their prescription out of state. That's a different story. But um, for the most part, you know, e-prescribing is sort of the mainstay here in California. And I think this is a good thing from one perspective. You know, it potentially uh, curbs prescription fraud and drug diversion. Um, and then also, you know, perhaps even create some efficiencies in the healthcare system by removing this paper trail. Um, now, I will say the the there are also unintended consequences as well if, if the regulations are too rigid. And you know, I'll, I'll kind of fall back on my experience uh, working in a community pharmacy many years ago when e-prescribing was you know being introduced, which was um, you know, I had a had a patient who used, you know, long-standing patient actually that used to get his prescription filled at the pharmacy. And so uh, you know, he he had, had his provider send over a schedule two drug at the time. And uh, we realized that, you know, we didn't, we didn't have it in stock. Uh, you know, it was on back order. There was a drug shortage going on, um, which actually, by the way, is, is drug shortage is, is on the rise year over year. So that it's more of a frequent problem now than it was then. Uh, but, you know, frankly, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have anything uh, to dispense on the day. So uh, this was a challenge because we couldn't transfer the prescription to another pharmacy. It was an e-prescription and there were there were regulations against transferring schedule two drugs. And so it after several hours, it took many tries, um, but we were able to get to the provider, the original provider's uh, clinic. We were able to get in touch with the prescriber and they were able to send that a new prescription over to a different pharmacy that had that drug in stock. So these are things that you don't necessarily think of logistically as you know uh, making an impact on the patient care, but it does make a, a really big impact if you can't get the drug in the first place to treat your condition. So, so you know there are some um, uh, advantages to e-prescribing, but there are also some potential disadvantages depending on what the regulations say um, about transferring prescriptions and and so forth. So we briefly mentioned the uh, prescription drug monitoring programs earlier, the PD PDMPs. In the state of California, we have the Cures system, uh, which was launched last year. And the Cures is basically a database to monitor prescription or of controlled substances. It plays an important role in the fight against the opioid crisis as well, of course. Uh, but it offers several benefits, and I'll talk about a few of them. So. 
it actually prevents uh, doctor shopping, which is a term that uh, I use. Basically, it, it sort of, uh, you know, if you're maintaining a comprehensive record of the patient's controlled substance history, uh, what this database does, it allows providers to see, you know, if there's been another prescription placed for a specific drug, and it prevents, it sort of prevents patients from obtaining multiple prescriptions from different providers in that sense. It also, cures also assists with uh, patient care. So the system allows healthcare providers to review the patient's controlled substance history. And then this assists with, you know, perhaps detecting uh, any duplicate medications that are on profile, uh, you know, that could interact with, with the substance. Um, it also can identify potential substance abuse problems, of course, from the patient, um, and just aids in making informed decisions overall for the clinician. So the question today, though, with all of these PDMPs and these databases is, uh, is that how proactively are these programs used by each state? So I know that just some preliminary research uh, that I did earlier, you know, I, I, I know that some states, uh, and it's not very transparent by the way, but I know that some states review uh, these sort of databases more, more proactively. You know, they look at abnormal patterns and exceptions, either on a recurring or ad hoc basis. However, there are some states that actually just don't do any of that. They just sort of react when there's a problem uh, being reported to them or by the, to the medical board uh, by the patient or the, the general public. And so, you know, this is an interesting um, opportunity where, you know, I think in the future, perhaps these, these systems may get more, more elegant, more mature, where they have, um, you know, perhaps some automation involved, some if, if and then rule engines or, or some artificial intelligence programs overlaying them. And, and so then you can naturally detect um, issues going on uh, you know, you, you can detect these larger patterns um, and, and sort of start investigating uh, different prescribers and patients uh, through that means. Uh, but right now, they're fairly rudimentary, I think, as, as far as databases go. So uh, in conclusion, to be successful in telemedicine, it's important to know the applicable prescribing rules and regulations because prescribing certain drugs in certain situations, as we've seen, via telemedicine otherwise may violate laws. Now, this makes it very necessary for clinicians and for us uh, who are in the healthcare system to stay up to date with evolving rules, both on the federal and state level, and then also to advocate for legislation that improves patient care. And, you know, we have to watch out for these uh, you know, arcade laws that exist. You know, how do we remove them or how do we update them? Um, also, how do we make regulation less complex for clinicians so they can operate without any risk? Again, I didn't bring my magical crystal ball today. Uh, so the future really is uncertain. But, you know, just generally based on the mounting public sentiment and sort of the advoc advocacy that has taken shape, uh, we have seen regulations can be changed and do change to adjust for the technologies that we have today and that we'll have in the future. So my last kind of statement here is, you know, we do need more outcomes-based research to be done. Uh, so that can, it can help us lead us in the right direction. And then that right direction is what we can then take on uh, building out pragmatic solutions that empower both the clinician and the patient. So that, with that, you know, I just wanted to share my references. They're available in the handout. Um, and then also, if you'd like to connect with me, if you've enjoyed this session and or you have any other questions, please connect me with me on LinkedIn. I'm fairly active on there. Uh, and then again, thank you just for uh, joining this session and uh, being part of this discussion and share any of these insights with your colleagues. Wow, thanks so much. That was so informative. It um, a lot of information there and, and lots of changes happening in, in healthcare. Um, and I, this is just part of, a, part of the transition from 
uh, care that all took place in the doctor's office of the hospital and moving it toward the home and and it's it's bumpy and and imperfect but um but um you know we're getting there step by step um there's a question from uh teresa uh i'm a pediatrician and we have been seeing a shortage of adderall i've noted several telehealth companies that uh, treat Adder give adderall to adults with adhd this has added to the shortage we have guidelines for diagnosing ADD, adhd in children most require diagnosis by age seven years of age with some exceptions however what documentation is being required of providers who are prescribing to a quote adults with adhd Any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I'm sort of digesting the question still. So, Dave, so, um, so I'm trying to clarify, are we speaking about shortages or um, perhaps documentation around shortages or am I getting that? Get my um, Teresa, feel free to, to come off mute oh, yeah. and, and, um, and join the conversation. Let's see, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, good. Perfect. Sorry, I had trouble earlier with my mute and all. No, um, so um, I think the shortage, we've seen the shortage of so many medications, you know, not just Adderall. I mean, we're seeing antibiotics, yeah. uh, even some really basic things that are we're having shortages on. Uh, in mm -hmm. particular, though, uh, around the regulation of controlled substances, um, what's interesting to me as a telehealth provider now but with my experience being a pediatrician in-house, a prescribing Adderall, is that we've always been as pediatricians extremely, um, you know, uh, resistant and adverse to not being, you know, we dot our I's, cross our T's, you know, have everything to show if a child has a diagnosis of ADHD. And what has really surprised me with the, it hasn't surprised me. It just it was a matter of time with the pandemic and with the telehealth uh, explosion as to so many of these like, doctor in the box kind of telehealth places that uh -huh. um, can just prescribe. And, um, and the reason I bring it up is that when I was applying to look at telehealth positions, um, I looked into some of these and a lot of them I found were very shady. Uh, they mm -hmm. were just like, and I'm like, well, what diagnosis do they have a prior, you know, like a, a diagnosis from a pediatrician, uh -huh. a neurologist, a psychiatrist, you know, something uh -huh. to indicate you know, we rarely see ADHD that just manifests in an adult spontaneously. You know, we usually see a history of it with children, but all of a sudden with these pop-up telehealth, everybody's got ADD and they all want Adderall. And so I can see a tremendous amount of abuse of that, not only by the patient, but also by some of these nefarious kind of organizations that are popping up. Uh, some of them will eventually, I'm sure, get caught if they're big enough but I think there's a lot of them out there that are flying under the radar. And I'm just wondering the regulation as to, I know in my chart, if you review it, what I have to have to document that a child has ADHD and ADD, but what is being required as far as you know of, of these adult providers, you know, the FPs and yeah. MDs, yeah, if, any, actually, if anything, aside from the diagnosis. Yeah, no, that, that's a really, really good question. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I don't have, frankly, I don't have the answer to kind of, what are, what are the what what is the protocol? What, what should be the pro standard protocol? But mm -hmm. I will say, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of jumping back to sort of this the cerebral case, right? Because that's kind of a prominent case uh, around this. And and you know, uh, one thing that you know I was able to kind of glean from that was, you know, right after you know they they sort of got caught in this sort of legal uh, conundrum with the Department of Justice um, and the DA was that. You know, they they immediately fired their CEO. Uh, they actually promoted their chief medical officer uh, to to the, to the leadership position. And you know, they've 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 taken some actions to correct at least some of their processes. So like, you know, they're they're actually uh, implementing uh, sort of these decision support tools within their health system or their organization. They're um, uh, you know creating better practices for the providers. So sort of these protocols. Uh, to assess, you know, hey, is this a is this a reasonable sort of diagnosis and treatment plan? Um, and so they're creating these sort of systems, if you will, um, you know, to make things 
not just efficient, but also more effective uh, for prescribing these, these agents. Um, and I, I definitely recognize, so I really appreciate the fact that you, you said shortages here because it was, it's, it's also like, yeah, um, if you don't have these systems in place and you're sort of, you know, you're really kind of, you have this massive demand for this drug, but you have only sort of a limited supply, how, what, what does that do for the public good? You know, I've actually, I've, I've worked with drug shortages probably, uh, probably the most majority of my career actually on, on the pharmacy end. And, you know, drug shortages are becoming an epidemic here in the US. Um, you know, we, we heard from another speaker actually from the AMA, a uh, speaker from the AMA, AMA earlier, he mentioned the Puerto Rico, you know, uh, the impact of Puerto Rico uh, and the hurricane, um, you know, disaster that occurred. Well, we didn't know that, uh, you know, half of the medications that Baxter provides, or, you know, is, is actually ma manufactured in Puerto Rico. And so when the hurricane hit, we had um, a massive shortage of IV bags, for example, in the hospitals because of that. And so there's this cascading effect that happened, on, you know, uh, on, on a massive level. So, um, so yeah, again, you know, looking at these organizations, in telehealth, um, you know, they can have a massive effect with supply chain. And how do we kind of mitigate for that? That's a really important question. I think every organization needs to answer it. So, Thank you. Yeah. That was a great question. Uh, great uh, discussion. Uh, we're at time. So I just want to thank, thank you, Beiju, and, and thank you to uh, all the attendees for your attention and, and this discussion. Um, really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. And thank you to the team and everyone who joined as well. Thank you.